Good evening. Uh, tonight we have two speakers sharing with us how we use the mediation skills in NEC4. And we say this is a perfect match. But before we kick off the seminar with our speakers, I would like to remind you, uh, if you wish to have CVD certificate, please put your name and also your email address down in the Q&A chat box. Fail English, you will not be getting the CVD certificate. So please do so if you haven't done so yet. And there will be a Q&A session at the end of the seminar. So please leave your questions during the seminar and uh, we will select some of the questions for the, for the speakers to answer. And for those questions that we do not have sufficient time to answer it, uh, we will do it uh, online and we'll share the answers with you uh, full online later. So this is the uh, one done for uh, tonight and we target to finish the uh, presentation by around eight o'clock and there will be around half an hour uh, Q&A session and we will close the session uh, by half, half eight uh, tonight. So our first speaker will be Robert Jarrett. He's senior consultant with the NEC and our global NEC user group secretary. Currently, he's based in Hong Kong and he has been his secretary since 2006 and he, he has been involved in a variety of uh, the NEC contract, including NEC uh, 2 through NEC 3 and now NEC 4. And he's also a credit data this two as his advisor and he uh, deliver PMA, PMA training from time to time. Our next speaker will be uh, Stanley Lowe. He's currently the uh, Vice Chairman of the Hong Kong Mediation Council. He practices as a lawyer currently and works with uh, deacons and he has over 35 years experience. And he has been involved in one of the uh, well-known uh, uh, NEC project with MTR. And he has uh, been advising on use uh, using NEC contracts uh, for uh, over a decade. So may I invite our speakers, Robert Jewell and Stan Lowe. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ivan. Welcome, Stanley. We're going to remove this. Is that correct? Yes, 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 sir. Very difficult to, I think, both speak, breathe, and listen when that mask is on. So, hopefully, that's all okay. So, uh, we have the longest title I've ever seen of a webinar. So, <laughs> synchronizing mediation skills, blah, 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 perfect match. So, this, this is all about understanding of, uh, of mediation and whether or not. Um, <clears throat> Whether or not some of the skills that are used in mediation can actually you know, help um, help with dispute resolution in NEC4 contracts. So what I'm going to look at reasonably quickly, although it never is that quick, is it? Is remind ourselves what is mediation. Um, there are different types of mediation, and actually there are uh, different different uh, types of it. Um, emerge all of the time. So an never changing field for mediation. So look at some of the skills that you need to both be a mediator or involved in mediation. Remind ourselves about what the dispute resolution processes are in NEC4 contracts and see if there's a fit there. Uh, look at, you know, have a distinguish between those um, dispute processes which are, uh, let's say, adversarial, in, um, in perhaps local reasons, and is there any synchronization? I'm still not sure how that's spelling with the Z, but never mind. Never mind. <laughs> so mediation. So I've, I've looked first of all at facilitative, which is hard enough to say, facilitative and evaluative mediation. So that, that I can see mediation has been around since ancient times, but it's still shaping itself 
today. I found out earlier that in uh, in Hong Kong, so what is it? It's a, an automatic. You, you have to go to mediation. It's mandatory yes. for all disputes. For well, for all disputes in, in in the court, actually, and yeah. anything that would normally go to the court. Yeah. So, so if you want the court to decide the dispute, first try mediation. Yeah, yeah. you have to go through the mediation first. Okay, it's, okay. it's not mandatory, and and to not not to be seen to be generally trying to settle could be to, uh, a disadvantage to you, I suppose, in uh, yeah. in the outcome of a court decision. That's so, right. Okay. okay. So, um, <clears throat> so mediation is a structured process. Uh, as a mediator, you, you get trained up in the process itself. Uh, and what you're trying to do ultimately is get to a place where both parties or current actually participants are happy or perhaps both are unhappy, i.e. one is not unhappy and one's particularly happy. So some sort of agreement that can both reach and then get on with the uh, with the rest of their lives. So you know in my training as a mediator I was started uh, I was trying that style of mediation which is facilitative and I'll tell you about the difference between that and evaluative shortly. Um, so uh, personally however mediation matures in the future I still think that's the, the right and proper entry into into uh, into mediation uh, and of course that's a purist approach and i'm a purist i'm an nec purist and a mediation purist mm -hmm. these things happen no that's a perfect match <laughs> and, uh, but but interesting i'm so, so my insurance which is some sort of professional indemnity insurance it is only about facilitative mediation yeah um, so be careful that those budding evaluative mediators out there make sure you carry yeah. the right insurance for that which you do. Absolutely. So what are we doing? We're future focused. We don't really look at the past. In fact, in the last 10 mediations I've done, I, I, the parties insisted, or participants, keep drifting into that, insisted I look at the documents that were the dispute. Uh, each other one I've, I have not looked at any past documents. So I have no idea what, well, I have a rough idea what the dispute is about, but no uh, knowledge of the content. And that, that's because we're not really there to decide an outcome of a dispute between the parties. We are there to work with the participants to to arrive at some decision they can they can both handle. So it isn't necessarily merit or law based. It is it is a negotiated deal facilitated by uh, a mediator. So we are we are future focused. We do not look at the past. In fact, the past has got you into a mess, hasn't it? That's why I always look at it. You couldn't agree. By looking, you know, looking into the past over the last year or three and creating thousands of documents, I'm not saying it's got you nowhere, but you haven't been able to actually reach agreement. So, what is the point of looking back over that those documents, which actually not served you that well in the past? So we tend to sort of push those to one side and, and focus on the needs and interests of the parties. So the mediator says we're in charge of the process. That's a little bit authoritarian, isn't it? it it's just leading the process really um, and we call we call that if like the claimant and, and, and disputants and the parties we try to call them participants so we're trying to set it, it is a, a, a I suppose it's a formal process in an informal setting where we are not um, but it's not courtroom style so we're not lining one up against the other so the participants are all time in charge of the outcome. If they want to, they can stand up and walk out of the mediation at any point. They do not think that it, it is worth their time or effort. No problem whatsoever. As a mediator, you would say, please may I have five minutes of your time to find out why you, you are or have walked out. But um, I, I like that thing. So think about that very carefully. You are in charge of the outcome. So once, once you hand it over to the more traditional, and let's call it an adversarial approach, adjudication, arbitration, litigation, you've lost control. You've completely lost control. You are now in the hands of some fine legal advisors. I'm sure it will save you absolutely well, but it's completely out, out of your hands, isn't it? Yeah, that's you, you're, the decision is, is taken out of your hands, will be decided by somebody else. So personally, in a negotiation, I like, I like to be in control of the outcome if I, if I possibly can. Um, now, so so the positions, you know, why we have a dispute is the starting point for a traditional legal process, and, and my suggestion is it hasn't served you that well. But we really focus on needs and interests. That, that's the game of, of mediators. And if you imagine the iceberg, and the bit you can see above the water is the position, the bit below is the one we really focus on. That's the needs and interests. 
Okay, so the wants, needs, interests, goals, desires, concerns, that's what we're trying to, trying to focus on as a, as a mediator. Uh, so evaluative mediation. So it's everything I've said really, which is why I've indented the bullets. It's no different really apart from um, <clears throat> you ultimately predict what you think a jury or, or a judge might decide based upon the what the I suppose the evidence what they've heard what they've heard. Now, now my concern with evaluative mediation is I need to put a different set of ears on to that which I'm doing the facilitative mediation, and, and I would if I'm going to if I'm going to predict what I think let, let's let's say a you know or adjudication or or, or court. if I have to predict what a judge might say, then I will have to decide things like weighting of evidence and I have to ask questions. Which means I'm going to have to look back a lot of time. So it's a real dilemma as to how much you have to look back if you're doing your balance of mediation. It's a tricky one to try and get to the parties to reach agreement, but then the fallback situation is you have to uh, give a prediction as to what you think a judge or jury would be likely to do in that particular given circumstances. So personally, I'm completely uncomfortable doing evaluative mediation. Uh, uh, to, to me, it's, it's more close to lots of conciliation. So that's so a purist in mediation, which is facilitative. I can see the interest here. People often say to me, what, what we would like you to do with the mediation bit is because you know about NEC, you can actually tell us what you think the answer will be as well, which is not the point of mediation. You're not there to give a decision or give an answer unless you take this particular route. So I have heard a lot of interest in evaluative mediation. Have you done any or much? Or? It's not actually practice in Hong Kong. As you said, your PII would, would, would not cover the outcome of evaluation. Be careful. Dangerous grounds, I think. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, be careful. However, we shouldn't, I'm not saying don't do it. And that's, as I say, there's different techniques and mediation evolving, but just be careful, just be careful. So the evaluative mediator, the purists, if you like, they, they are uh, attempting to structure the process as best they can. They are trying to positively help the outcome of the mediation. So you do play things like devil's advocate and you ask permission. OK, participants, if I ask you questions that maybe you don't like to hear and you're not trying to undermine the participants' case, it's reality testing. You, you're, you know, have you thought about this? What, 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 would you, what is, do you think is the strongest part of your particular case? You know, what was the weakest part? Mm -hmm. How much might it turn on the weakest part? Just how vulnerable are you? Just how strong are you? Just normal sort of sort of questioning techniques. Um, so, so the evaluative mediator, I think, in my opinion, is more concerned. I, I think you're. Well, I don't know if it's right to assume it, you will not succeed, but you have to really focus on the legal rights of the participants. You're then in that dilemma. How much time do I spend making sure that I understand the evidence in front of me and I can give proper weighting to it, as opposed to what are the needs and interests of the parties? I think you cut yourself up in, into pieces. Um, but why people like this is that they believe you have an expertise in the substantive area of the dispute, and that's a really big uh, attraction, I think. To this. Anyway, as I said before, this looks and smells like conciliation to me. So, in my understanding, done conciliation, but my understanding is you try as best you can to help the parties reach an agreement via mediation techniques, and then if that doesn't work, you write a decision, which is slightly different to the evaluative mediator, who's giving an opinion on what they think the outcome will be, and this is a written, a written decision. Well, that's my understanding. So participants, are you not claimants? Uh, well, what do I think? Why do they use mediation? Well, they want justice. They say they want justice, but what, what is justice? Is it is it having your day in court, being heard, you know, saying your piece, getting all the money, getting the right money? Uh, one mediation did once, the gap was that big, and during the day it got bigger. It was actually three times as big two hours in than it was when we started with it. I thought, literally, we have absolutely no chance here. But we, we got there, we got actually to, to nil. They could drop hands, basically. We'll just walk away, effectively shake hands, and neither will take further action against the other, except one of the participants wanted uh, a dollar and an apology. 
Yeah. Got the dollar, didn't get the apology. <laughs> <laughs> the dollar is, yep, here it is, but the apology, no, step too fast. <laughs> Doesn't always work. That's the ego. Yeah, bit of ego, bit of ego. Yeah. Uh, but what do, what do the monitors do as a mediator? And you have to be really careful here. So your job is to be independent, in, in, impartial, you know, fair to both parties, but they want you to listen to them. They also want you to sit with being overly sympathetic and shedding tears and things like that. Mm. So, you know, you're not a judge or an arbitrator, you don't have to be absolute stiff up the lip, but yeah. be a human being, be, be empathetic, you know, listen and, you know, just be careful with the, with the nodding and all the other body language that we normally get sick, sucked into. So you're not there to stay, to take sides, and we are just solely there to get the participants for a solution they can live with. But uh, I found that these things happen. <laughs> There's a lorry that arrives, and this is the past. What would you like to do with the past? I would get rid of the past if I was you. It hasn't served you any purpose at all. They try and they try and call me sir from time to time. <laughs> Please don't call me sir. Um, you know, I don't need to. Uh, I might just like to name no time. <laughs> it's not that formal. Um, and that are also very polite, you know, can I get you a drink, sir, and all those things in the hope that I might favour them. I, I'm not there to favour you. There's no favouring at all. I'm not deciding anything. You're deciding. The participants are deciding. I'm just going to yeah, bring you a process that I hope you will get to somewhere you can both live with. But they do still think that, also, but you will decide, won't you? You will tell us whether we'll win, won't you? No, I won't tell you that. You know? um, so I do worry that a lot of people don't understand mediation uh, and actually um, <clears throat> I've done this a few times when you do a google search mm. for, for mediation I haven't missed target and target meditation so you get all these uh, different practices up but never mind so understand what you're letting yourselves in for read the agreement most people don't you, you issue a mediation agreement most people don't actually read it in fact it's just changed so there's an online method of course of using mediation these days and uh, participants promise not to video it and all that sort of thing so is all of that a problem um but probably not just needs explaining so I, I think there's a willingness of most participants they want to settle they want to settle it's the same true there as an advisor this is tongue-in-cheek very much tongue-in-cheek and how much does that sit with the advisor's duties of ethics so i think we have a duty to help participants get to a place they can live with as, with as little stress and pain as possible. The, the dilemma is how much of that settlement needs to be um, fact or merit based. You know, at the end of the day, what I, what I found is that workplace mediations as well as civil and commercial. Civil and commercial, I'm not saying it's just about money, but it's just about money. Whereas actually there's, there's uh, people torn apart in workplace uh, disputes and even more so in, in family law. So I choose to back away from things like that because you get very rational people uh, where, where they have disputes. So that was all about mediation. What about NEC then? Is there any, any shred of mediation within the NEC four contracts? Well, just what I would say from the outset is there's nothing to stop using mediation at any time. At any time in any contract, let alone any C4 contracts, you can just try and solve the dispute by mediation. Why do you need a formal mediation clause? I don't, I don't think you do. In fact, what I would say is, I, I, I would rather not force people to mediate. I would rather, if they're reluctant, I, then I wouldn't want to be the mediator. If they genuinely want to mediate and, and and, and uh, reach some sort of settlement or agreement, then I'm all for it. But if you, if you put some of his arm behind their back and force them into mediation, I, I think it would be unlikely it will, it will work. So the fact that actually NEC does not use the terminology mediation doesn't stop you doing it. But but there are some things, some processes you can, I think you can actually use mediation. And the standout one for me is W1. Um, this is a, in, in a number of the Contracts W1 and W2 is found in the main contracts of, of NEC uh, four contracts, in particular ECC and PSC and TSC. Apologies for that acronym, but we dealt with those in the previous webinars, haven't we? Um, but in W1 is a dispute escalation process, and the first port of call is senior representatives. Now that, that is two representatives from each party in the NEC four contract that will go on to become 
a participant, possibly in the mediation, who basically negotiate. So their job as senior representatives is to attempt to negotiate, to satisfactorily conclude uh, a dispute. And if they cannot, or if they cannot conclude all of it, there's some leftover, then the leftover bit or all the dispute can be picked up by other party and taken to adjudication. Uh, and if they don't like the outcome of adjudication, they're free to go to arbitration or litigation. Uh, one, one difference in the NC4 Alliance contracts, the Alliance board themselves can go to an independent expert for an opinion. Uh, I can't remember the top of my head if they are bound by that opinion or it's just an opinion. I suppose an opinion is an opinion, isn't it? I think that is not quite a decision, is it? But, Short contracts. So we have a variety of NC short contracts, of course. Now, in there is a slightly lesser process. You can go, you go straight to adjudication and then arbitration litigation. But apart from in uh, certainly in the UK, where adjudication is a statutory right, therefore if one party wants to go there, the other is, is bound to follow. Then, even in the short contracts, you can mediate at any, at any point if you believe that to be the right technique or process to sort the problem out. And so the adversarial alternatives, I've mentioned adjudication, arbitration, litigation, that I think they are traditional. Uh, would they be called adversarial? I suppose so. And then we, we pitch people against each other, don't we? You know, my, my case is better than yours, my position is better than yours, my evidence is better than yours, my expert witnesses, my legal advisors, everything I've got is better than yours. So we, we promote that adversarialism. Um, how we, we, we pick on each other's sort of case or position, but we're not really looking at needs and interests. So I suppose that's traditional and therefore adversarial. Um, and again, so in, in all the alternatives apart from senior representatives, we really do focus on positions and we try and you know, uh, demonstrate to the person in front of us who will make a decision upon our decision just how good our position is, just how good our evidence is and just how good our expert witnesses are. We, we in no way focus on needs and interests, but, which I find quite tragic sometimes when you have a case that perhaps goes to court that the judge is not really remotely interested, it appear to me, in the catastrophe that the particular dispute may have caused one party. In fact, I did one mediation once where um, one, one poor soul actually had was so stressed out, two heart attacks in the run-up to the mediation, which is pretty grim. Uh, now I've got to be really careful not to, you know, not to be biased in any way, shape, or form for that for that particular participant. But it brings home the reality of, of how just how damaging disputes are and stress are. And you know, I, I'm pretty sure that they did actually reach agreement. But if you take that sort of delicate balance first to court and put them in a witness box, then, you know, bang, could be gone. Uh, not good, not good. So let's look at the, so my bit on synchronising before I pass over. So what's very interesting to me, I found out this in uh, I think Jakarta last year, was uh, that the Philippines is teaching their, their, their children at schools uh, how to mediate, which I think is, is fantastic. Imagine a whole science, society blessed with the skills to sort out problems without involving adjudicators, arbitrators, or judges. So, uh, all lawyers, sorry, <laughs> I need to find another job, but you'll be happy with that, wouldn't you? I think. It's a beautiful place in the Philippines. Go there and enjoy it. Don't go there and argue. Um, however, we're looking for a type here. We're looking for that word synchronized. So, let's try and synchronize mediation with, with MEC. Now, I, I think as a project manager, you might think, oh, I can, I can do that. I can. Media, I think you have to be really careful here. I don't think you are acting in any way, shape or form as a mediator, as a project manager. There are two standout clauses for me in NEC contracts, 10.1, 10.2. You've got to do what the contract tells you to do. You've got to use that spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. I don't think you're in a position to focus on needs and interests. If something hasn't happened, that they say the contractor has not done something such as mm. submitted the first program for acceptance, shown the information requires. Because of 10.1, you must apply clause 50.5. You must retain in the next payment certificate 25% of the price of the work done today. Okay, that's detail, but blah, blah, blah. You have to do what the contract tells you to do, which is 
directly opposite to that which I'm talking about in terms of mediation. So I think the parties can choose to use mediation mediation skills themselves to head off disputes and the process most likely the best fit they have seen the representatives but I, I advise our project manager to be very careful and don't think that you're suddenly mediating and can sort out your disputes in that way. Uh, within the senior representatives clause and clause W1, they can use any procedure they consider necessary. Um, so they could just negotiate, they could possibly have a round of golf if they so with winner takes all. I've done something similar, I'm not going to details, but um, you know, they could use a mediator. What's a mediator? Basically, it's a facilitation of a negotiation. So they can use whatever procedure they consider necessary to try and resolve the period, but they only have three or so weeks to, to do that. So I, I'm all for mediation, I'm all for getting people trained up on mediation, that, that air of calmness, that process, that looking at needs and interests. Uh, and I would therefore recommend to industry that it studies and uses mediation more. So all the NEC4 contracts don't use mediation in the processes. I would definitely recommend that people become more educated in the world of mediation. Uh, more trained mediators, even though I believe there's a lot here in our car. I was told 10,000, not sure if that's true or not, which is why I would never get any work as a mediator in Hong <laughs> Kong, but never mind. Uh, but it's a good and useful technique to avert formal dispute resolution. Stanley, thank you. Time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to the presentation today. Uh, what we're trying to achieve uh, from this point onward is to discuss how mediation could be synchronized with the NEC4 ECC contracts. Now, <clears throat> during this session, I'm going to discuss the uh, review. What's the philosophy of NEC, the philosophy of uh, dispute resolution in NEC3 and NEC4, and then I'll go through the uh, mediation skills, and then I'll discuss uh, how the synchronized mediation skill to NEC for re resolving and avoiding dispute mechanism. Now, uh, what's the philosophy of NEC? There's a famous guy, a famous man called Dr. Martin Barnes. I heard about his name in the 1970 when I was starting doing the, uh, the civil engineering SMM. Uh, he was the one who, who wrote it, created it. Created it yes, uh, Dr. Barnes said for NEC, our philosophy was to produce something which cured every known ill of traditional contracts. We did not have to compromise. Everything we thought would be a good idea went in and we could decide what to put in solely on the basis of what would stimulate all those using it to manage their contribution well. Now, Dr. Barnes is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and is a Churchill Fellow. What's a Churchill Fellow at the moment? I would imagine it's something to do with Winston Churchill, but you have to excuse my ignorance. I am not a Churchill Fellow. So I don't wear ties. So I'm not going to get in that club. Although I admire him very much, particularly the, the small cigar. Yeah. Um, the key success of NEC contract relies mm. upon parties being collab collaborative and proactive. Did you say corrupt? <laughs> <laughs> Collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, philosophy of this new resolution in NEC3 and NEC4, there, there, there are differences between the NEC3 and NEC4. Um, for NEC3, there are two options. Option W1, uh, this bill will be resolved by adjudication, unless the UK housing grant uh, construction and regeneration act 1996 applies. Well, we don't have this act in Hong Kong. Uh, for option W2, adjudication is the method to resolve disputes. Uh, because we don't have this uh, uh, housing grant in Hong Kong, therefore W2 is not applicable in Hong Kong. May, may I have something yeah. about to interrupt the uh, not at all. security payment legislation? Yeah. I don't understand they've been looking closely at that particular piece of legislation. So yes, we are. watch this space. I think it's 10 years from which I'm a piece of legislation has been going around in circles, but yes, may, right right they right. maybe, maybe the yeah. same, similar here. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Well, philosophy of this theory resolution, NEC3 and NEC4. Now, let's look at NEC4. 
It's now called the resolving and avoiding dispute. That's the mechanism. Look at the word avoiding. All right. The intended outcome of any C4 contracts is that time and money performances are improved while increasing standards by encouraging collaborative working in order to achieve shared project objectives. This philosophy promotes a less adversarial approach, decreasing the chance and impact of costly disputes. That's actually extracted from the NEC dictionary. Uh, did you write the dictionary? <laughs> I remember some of those words. <laughs> so the title, if you can see, actually changed from NEC 3, which is a dispute resolution, to NEC 4, which is called uh, resolving and avoiding dispute. For NEC4, uh, option W1 and W2, use of senior representatives, as, Bob has, as uh, Robert has uh, briefly discussed. And there is a new option called option W3. That's the introduction of the Dispute Avoidance Board, the DAB, which is something new in NEC4 contracts. <clears throat> uh, talk about mediation skills, I, I would like to start by citing some of the good comments on, on, on mediation. In the UK, there's a case called Susan Dunnett and uh, Rail Track uh, PLC 2002, in which Lord Justice Brooke notes in his judgment that skilled mediators are now able to achieve results satisfactorily to both parties in many cases, which are quite beyond the power of lawyers and courts to achieve. This court has knowledge of cases where intense feelings have arisen, for instance, in relation to clinical negligence claims. Is, is it beyond the power of lawyers and courts to achieve <laughs> beyond the lawyers? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I must admit this is true, actually. The Lord continues to say that when the parties are brought together on neutral soil with a skilled mediator to help them resolve their differences, it may very well be that the mediator is able to achieve a result by which the parties shake hand at the end and feel that they have gone away having settled the dispute on terms with which they are happy to live with. Occasions are known to the court in claims against the police, which can give rise to as much passion as a claim of this kind when a claimant's precious horses are killed on a railway line, by which an apology from a very senior police officer is all that the claimant is really seeking and the money side of the matter fall away. That's the, similar to, to Robert's uh, yeah. one dollar and apology. I think get the apology, but <laughs> yeah, but that's what they wanted. That's, that's what you find out, isn't it? They're the needs. Yeah, the at the end of the day, just say sorry. Apology, sometimes. yeah, just say sorry. Can just you, close the gap. You do have yeah. to be genuine, so I see where sometimes it's not yeah. genuine. You're almost crossing the fingers behind them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Similar comments were made in Hong Kong. Paul Y Management Limited and Eternal Unity Development Limited uh, in 2008. This is actually the case I, 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 I've gone through because I was the uh, I, I worked for Paul Y at the time. Uh, Judge J states in his judgments that parties are represented by very experienced lawyers, and I'm sure that counsels involved are more than capable of advising their respective clients on other possible options to resolve the disputes, including mediation. As I see it, the case cries out for mediation. The judge continued to say that before the court spends more resources than efforts in this piece of litigation, they would be well advised to sit down to explore the options of mediation with the lawyers. From a business point of view, it is much better to spend management time and cost on restoring the project than on a piece of litigation which may ultimately result in a no-win situation for both parties, which is absolutely true, yeah. absolutely true. So, uh, Judge Jerome also said, I also share this sentiment of uh, Lam J on mediation as the most sensible way forward in this case. Now, I'd like to go on to talk about some key success factors for mediation. The first one is authority. The parties should send people with sufficient authority to the meeting, whether it is a full authority or a predetermined limit authority, that's that's fine. But if you are going into a mediation session, don't try to, to make phone calls to your boss and say, hey, can I do this, can I do that? 
it, it's just not good. I mean, it, it just don't give the other party the, the, the confidence that you represent your party, your, your company here to make a decision, you know. Uh, not physically present is it's very difficult to convince the person, the decision maker, uh, because if the decision maker is not in mediation session, then it is very difficult because if it's not there, you just can't make them move. You know? uh, it's also a bit, sometimes quite frustrating. The decision maker is always not there, and the guys always go go out and make phone calls, you know. And the other part of me think is disrespectful, and they don't take it, uh, uh, take a mediation seriously. It's a cultural thing, isn't it? So I, I think yeah. that's true. It is quite frustrating to have to wait for somebody to make a call. But yeah. it is some unless they've got a genuine reason, you know, mm. they're saying I have more important things to do. So yeah. it is quite disrespectful. Yeah. And the next, the next one is to have a positive, positive mindset. You really enter into a mediation session with the objective that the case can be settled. You always think positive and with high expectation that this is going to work, right? It will work if you make it work. Mm -hmm. And good faith, take the uh, mediation uh, seriously, uh, put in the adequate and right resources to, to the uh, mediation session, to uh, maintain a reasonable approach with respect to the other party, uh, be flexible, because during the mediation session and discussion, negotiation, what have you, new things will come out, new uh, ideas, new documents will be disclosed, uh, which may change the party's negotiation strategy. So be flexible to consider the new documents and the new criteria, uh, uh, which aim at, at closing the gap. So you have to adjust your negotiation strategy and expectation from time to time and be flexible. And this one is to, to be realistic. Try to avoid making unrealistic evaluation of the case. Right? Common sense prevails. Don't be too greedy. Right? If you're too greedy, people will feel a uh, bit uh, you know, uh, annoyed for, for receiving the uh, very extremely high uh, settlement offer. Manage your expectations and know when to make a concession, know when to stop, know when to make a concession. Be prepared. Usually, well prepared parties are the successful parties. So you have to prepare for the case, whether it's a mediation, adjudication, or litigation, or arbitration. You have to prepare. You, know, you have to know your case inside out and to present your position effectively, clearly to the other parties, what you really desire, what you really think you deserve. Then you have to be patient. It's difficult to, to deal with people who are impatient. Right? Uh, problem needs to be resolved step by step. Right? You cannot just jump to the conclusion you need it. You have to be patient to go through the problem bit by bit dissecting the differences in bite-sized chunks bite for discussion and agreement. And when a bite-sized chunk is agreed, you can, parties can actually sign a, a very simple MOU, the document, the, the, the agreement on these small things. But when the small things are put together, mm. then at the end of the day, the gap will be so narrow that the parties will think, hey, why not just close it out? We've gone so far. So you have to be patient and try to dissect your problem in bits that could be uh, agreed by parties. Uh, the other thing is very important is to listen. Try to listen to the other people. Uh, don't ignore others' view because they look at things from a different angle, which is totally different from yours. But if you listen to other people's idea, maybe they have a look at things from a different angle, they may give you some new ideas um, to put your personal feelings and egos aside, all right? listen to the other people. Um, a lot of people are, are pretend to be listening, you know, because they think what they want to, to, to hear. That's the, that's the bad thing. Um, negotiating plan, uh, evaluate your chance of success at trial. If the case is not successful in mediation, you have to go to the court. What's the chance of success? 
insurance coverage, any any uh, part of your damage which could be covered by insurance, if it is covered by insurance, don't put it in your uh, uh, negotiation settlement proposal because you will be uh, double dipping, right? Second bite of a cherry, you know. Um, there have to be a better and holistic understanding of the issues from all perspectives. That means you need to, to consider every alternative in your negotiation. Negotiation tactic different from parties to parties, uh, but my, my, my suggestion is that uh, you have to be very bold, don't show any witness, uh, because you have to stand on what you think you, would, you deserve. Uh, sometimes you have to give signals that, sorry, no further offer will be made unless the, the other parties make a similar move, right? Sometimes we call it tit for tat moves, right? That means uh, part of the making firm and hardline approach. This is it. This is it. Don't try to be uh, wishy washy, all right? Stand on your ground. Hint probable range of settlement. Sometimes in your negotiation, if you try to break the ice, perhaps you can hint. A possible range of settlement you can consider from that to that, you know, uh, or perhaps you can propose some apologies and sign of remorse. It may ease the tension and anger of the other parties, you know, because you are, they may think you are actually thinking on the behalf of these problems. Let, let's try to look at what what tactics are actually counterproductive, right? <laughs> These sort of texts must be avoided to threaten or insult the other parties. Yeah. Some people will think, well, I'll try to threaten you in the, in the, in, in the mediation. This, this is not going to work. Abusive conduct to undermine the opponent saying, oh, you're not good enough. You're, you're, you're claiming you never succeed in court. Don't, don't put all these abusive conducts to the other parties. Because they, 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 they may think that, well, you look down upon me. Why should I sit down and talk about it with you? Unreasonable opening demands and offers have not to be greedy. Refuse to make any offer or to respond to the other party's proposal. Say, for example, the other parties hint a, a, a settlement range to you, but you just don't respond at all. Uh, that that would be very bad uh, to the other party. The last one, which is quite true actually, uh, criticizing or embarrassing the other party's representatives, saying that they are not good enough, how, how, how bad they are, particularly the lawyers. You know. <laughs> now, let, let's look at uh, synchronizing mediation and NEC4, uh, the resolution mechanism. Uh, as I briefly talked about, NEC4 uh, option W1 requires dispute to be referred to uh, uh, senior representatives, uh, one from each party, and they are required, uh, uh, disputed parties are required to submit 10 sides of A4 case statement plus supporting evidence. Well, it's, it's not clear, Robert, it's that, it's that 10 sides of A4, it didn't specify the font size. <laughs> so it's not, so it's six font double sided. Yeah. <laughs> And also, and the line spacing. <laughs> exactly. So it could be abused very easily. In the old <laughs> uh, Party Senate representative is required to resolve the referred uh, dispute in three weeks and to give a list of agreed and disagreed issues. So they're only given three weeks to resolve the, the matters. And if you right. give them 10,000 pieces of paper, it's not going to work. It's not going to help them at all. Actually. Yeah. Now, they will produce a list of agreed and disagreed issues. The list of agreed, that would be easy. So give it to the project manager, implement it into the project. But for the disagreed issue, what, what, what are they going to do? Now, within the three weeks, the senior representative will try to resolve the disputes amicably, ring fancy issues that can be agreed, leaving those sticky ones on, on the list of disagreed issues. Resolving these differences amicably requires the senior representative to approach them with the right frame of mind, with the use of suitable mediation yes. skills, as we talk about just now. Now, um, 
NEC4 op option W3 requires setting up a dispute avoidance board. As the name suggested, the board is there to avoid disputes before there is any dispute at all. So normally there are three DAB members in the board. If parties wish to do so, they can name just one in, in the contract data, but normally they name one each for, for each party. And the, the two members will jointly select the third DAB members. So the three DAB members will act impartially to assist, assist parties to resolve potential dispute before they, they, they actually become disputes. The DAB members will visit the site at uh, regular intervals uh, stated in the contract data normally on a monthly basis. They'll inspect the progress of the project and become aware of any potential disputes. So during the site meeting and site visit, uh, the project manager and the contractor's representative will brief them on the site progress, on, on what's going on on site, what may be, what may become a, a dispute. So the board members will, will talk to the, to, to the uh, site representative, appreciate what, what's the differences from both parties and see how they can suppress the issues before they, they actually become a dispute. Before notification of an issue to the other party, a potential dispute is referred to the DAB in two to four weeks for which DAB finds ways to amicably resolve the potential dispute and make recommendations. So, so the, the DAB members need to resolve uh, the, the, the dispute uh, amicably uh, by discussing with the site representative, trying to find ways to close the gap. Uh, it's, it's quite facilitative. Yeah. yeah. Within the four weeks, within four weeks of, of DAB's recommendation, the parties, the, the aggrieved parties may refer the dispute to the tribunal. The tribunal is named in the uh, contract data. It can be uh, arbitration or litigation. And again, trying to suppress potential disputes require the AB members to approach difference, differences with suitable mediation skill, as we just talked about. So uh, for me, they. These, these DAB board members are very important. They have a very important responsibility because if they are if efficient, then theoretically, most of the differences will be suppressed, all right, without even going to the uh, to, to the uh, uh, senior representatives. Yeah. I always think they're uh, they're like wise owls. They have a good nose for these sort of things. So mm. experience, and mm. they ask the right questions, and so well, you know. In my experience, when this has happened, then you can end up yeah, in, possibly in a general general mess. So, yeah. And here's what you can do to avert it. So. Absolutely. So they, they, they are there to, to suppress problems. Very similar to the, uh, the dispute resolution advisors in Hong Kong. Yeah. 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 Very, but, but in this situation, normally it's one representative from both for each party, and then both members will sit, jointly sit at a third yeah. member. So it would make a, a, a broad uh, uh, a view on, on problems. So, um, when we talk about uh, mediation skills uh, applicable to the uh, senior representative and, and the DAB board members, uh, I, I would certainly suggest the Hong Kong Mediation Council to design a 40 hours mediation training workshop uh, to provide uh, initial training to uh, the uh, senior representative and the board members of the DAB. Well, I'm just thinking out loud, 20 hours on, on basic mediation skills and 20 hours on practical training. Practical mediation training means attending a, a negotiation, formulating your strategy, find ways to close the gaps, etc. So I, I'm thinking about if the senior members and board members are interested in, in undertaking this training, I think 20 hours will give them the basic skill. And if they become more interested to become mediators, then they can attend a further 20 hours. 
uh, and perhaps they may pave the way to become arbitrators, uh, mediators themselves. So, um, that's it. Surprisingly, right. in time. Some yeah. Else, isn't it? So we uh, we mediated that very successfully. Yes. <laughs> Let's go and uh, put it into practice. Okay. <laughs> um, Robert and I are, are, will be very happy to answer any question you may have. Lots of questions. Okay. Uh, maybe I pick this one. All right. Uh, during the course of mediation, Party A found that the advisor seems not favor with him and want to withdraw. How to stop Party A to do so? And what action or protection Party B have? So the advisor, the advisor suddenly turns on Party A. So it's really yeah. Funny. And says so basically you've yeah. got problems. How to stop party A doing what? Want to withdraw? Why would you stop them withdrawing? The job of the mediator, I don't think, is to. One party may think uh, this mediator is biased. Oh, the mediator is biased. Okay. Oh, is that, is that what I'm saying? I, I was assuming it meant the party's advisor, not the mediator. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to find out, actually. Which one? Let's, let's cover both. Is they're both interesting. Yeah. yeah. So if you if you sat in front of a mediator and you think he's not listening to you, can, you know, completely he's obviously favouring the other party, then I mean you still don't make a decision as a mediator. So so, so right. Right, if, whatever they're doing or not, I mean I would lose faith in the mediator in the process and think take advice from our own advice and say, shall we just leave because you know this guy's an idiot? You know. <laughs> but, there, but there's no decision, is there? You know, yeah. can you can you turn around to your advantage? Probably not. I can't think how it might help you. But but I, if I'm if I'm honest, despite the mediator, if the mediator is an idiot or seems to be somehow favouring, which isn't going to help anyway, then press on, push the mediator to one side, and negotiate with party B. Just carry on. You carry on trying to reach any time. Reach a deal. In fact, you can get rid of the mediator. The mediator is so bad. So would you mind leaving the building we'll just carry on all we're doing is facilitating negotiation isn't it yeah. so I, I think you know you could uh, carry on with or without the mediator i think that that perceived certainly perception of bias but that bias isn't going to turn into anything anyway because there's no report or decision or recommendation or anything we're just trying to help you two you know actually resolve your differences and that's all on that one and then we'll spin it around and so the advisor well, if you want to look at that as well. Like it happens anyway. Yeah. 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 Well, so this, the way I read it is Party A's advisor basically saying, so well, I think actually, I mean, listen to all of this, you've got no case. Mm -hmm. You should run up home quickly or something like that. Well, we don't want the person to withdraw from the mediation because there's still a dispute, isn't there? Unless, unless Party A is, is the aggressor, if you like, the person making the claim. If they were to withdraw that, then that I means you reached an agreement, doesn't it? I will draw my claim, we both have no claim against each other, mediation over. Yeah. Um, so if the advisors say you, you're in, your case is far worse than I first thought, then you've no chance of winning, uh, that, to be honest, that's music to my ears as a mediator because that's an honest advisor telling their client they've got no chance. Face the reality. You've got no chance. This is, they're doing their own reality testing. Provided the advice is not not a fool, then you, you can still you can sack your advisor. You know, I actually see one mediation where the, the, the client, the party, in terms of their advice has said, You've said enough for one day, thanks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I'm gonna push on from here. It's, it's yeah. for the parties to meet in, not they're, for the they're advisor. The ones they're the That's ones right. with the pain, they're the ones that are suffering. Yeah. Advisors are merely that you're there to advise, aren't you? Give them an opinion, and you need to know your limitation of your ability to advise. You might be a technical advisor, a legal advisor, yeah. commercial advisor. Nobody, I don't think anybody is a jack of all trades. In mediation process, it should be the uh, parties who speak more yeah. rather than the advisor, legal advisor or yeah. technical advisor. They should be stand by there just in case. Just the support. Yeah, they advice. Support. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
But this uh, and our next one maybe uh, Stan needs to answer this question. It's oh, about Hong cool. Kong <laughs> mouth accreditation. So uh, <laughs> these uh, attendees are, as far as I know, the current Hong Kong mouth accreditation only covers facilitative mediation skills. Do the evaluative mediation skills need to be trained up specific, uh, specifically for NEC projects? Okay, let me uh, have a go. Um, now, first, first thing, NEC project uh, does not require uh, evaluative mediation at present. Uh, what, what I was talking about is to adopt the mediation skills in the uh, dispute resolution process under the NEC four contract. Now, going back to this question, it's very interesting because um, traditionally Hong Kong has been adopting facilitated mediation whilst across the border in China, they use a lot of evaluated mediation. Mm. Now, with people, a lot of people are actually talking about adopting evaluated mediation in Hong Kong. And there has been proposals to uh, put forward training courses on evaluated uh, mediation skills. Now, uh, just for your information, we have uh, an evaluated mediation uh, seminar, webinar, on the 22nd of April, oh, okay. yeah, uh, arranged by the Hong Kong Mediation Council. Uh, it's also free of charge, actually. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, in that uh, webinar, we're going to discuss how we can adopt <clears throat> uh, evaluated uh, me uh, mediation in Hong Kong. We'll explore the, the pros and cons of uh, evaluated uh, mediation. So if you're interested in, in this webinar, click to the uh, Hong Kong Mediation Council website uh, and register. There's all sorts of things. I mean, remember MEDAR, remember that? So oh, yeah. yeah. Do mediation and then pop over, over to arbitration yeah. if it doesn't work. And, you know, I, I don't know. Like I said, I'm a bit of a purist, but yeah. sometimes you need to be creative and we need to think of different ways. What we want to avoid is that long time in court and the long expense and, and the pain and anguish and the stress associated with that. Absolutely. In my opinion. I mean the question what was actually there was about NEC projects. So as we were saying we don't would you use evaluative mediation in an NEC project? Well I, th I think that the senior representatives could do because yeah. they are they are deeply versed in the contract machinery aren't they? So yeah. they want the, potentially to use mediation and they probably want a little bit of direction which you probably get from evaluative mediation so mm. but I would imagine the senior representatives are more interested in in that so what was the question again uh, do you need to be trained it specifically uh, well remember it's not the, the it's not the senior representatives necessarily nor the project manager or the supervisor nor anybody else but mm. the person you bring in is the is the mediator they need to be trained up yeah so we're recommending that lots of people get into and study mediation become mediators but not everybody has to be a mediator to use mediation you just want one person that is blessed with the skills of mediation yeah. we need a facilitator a facilitator Okay, all right, here's another one. Uh, well, maybe both of you can uh, help on this question. Uh, what's the main difference between mediation and arbitration? And also, uh, may I extend, what's the difference between negotiation and mediation as well? Right, okay, do you want me to have a go? What main difference have you got? I can't do that. I can't bring myself just to one point. <laughs> I, I personally say time, cost, and quality. So. I think your mediation is much quicker, much cheaper, and I personally think you can get a better quality outcome because you stay in control of the participants of the decision itself. Yeah. Um, so I'm a big, big fan of, of, of achieving that in mediation. So I think our arbitration has its point, has its place. And maybe maybe one of the great questions we everybody wants to is where, when would you never use mediation or when would you prefer to use, what do you think is best to use? Arbitration rather than mediation is a, is a good question. Where we want to add that, add that, but you know, our arbitration has its place. But in my experience, it's lengthy, costly, um, and 
you, you, it's a different thing. It's, you are achieving. So, you know, what the advantage of arbitration over mediation is that they look at the facts and they look at the evidence and you get an evidence base of outcome according to law. But is that really what we want? We talk about yeah. the horses on the railway line. Yeah. Would the law, would the law help us with that? We just yeah. want an apology sometimes, or we just want we just something different than we would get through the courts. Because I've seen arbitration. To me, it's a mirror image of the courts. Yeah. You know, they they have to, you know, look at the evidence and weigh it up and make a decision according they to. They look for ways that they lead to the facts. Right. Yeah. So, so I think I think I think it's really early, but personally, I think adjudication arbitration and litigation have got severe restrictions on what that decider can can, can do for the people who are in pain yeah. they're not there to, to to focus on needs and interests they're just there to look all the way back five years ago something that happened and say well because you did or didn't do this I award against you etc so uh, I'm a big fan, but, but you know, maybe sometimes you shouldn't mediate, maybe sometimes you should arbitrate or... or mm -hmm. Right, right. Maybe Stanley can help answering another question. What's the difference between negotiation and mediation? Well, negotiation is really something between two parties. Well, mediation is actually having a, an impartial mediator to assist the parties to close the gap. So that's the main difference, having a third party to, uh, to facilitate the, the, the negotiation. So, well, if we go back to the question, the main difference between a mediation and arbitration, one of the points I can think of is that once parties reach an agreement uh, during a the mediation, they have to sign a settlement agreement. And that settlement agreement itself is enforceable at law. If, if parties don't sign the, the, the settlement agreement, that, that, that there is nothing that the law can, can apply. However, for, for arbitration, the arbitration award itself is enforceable at law. So that's the main difference. Yeah, yeah it's a binding decision. The mediators do, mediator do not give decision. No, yeah. they no, just no, have no, them. Right. Okay. Yeah. To facilitate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next one, uh, I think this, this one is interesting. Uh, do you think there are benefits for all your managers and senior representatives to attend some mediation negotiation skills trainings? Well, I, I would de definitely the senior representatives, they should definitely do some negotiation skills training. So there's a, an art to negotiation, and negotiation has changed a lot. So there's no end of you know free online information books available in there. So gone are the days where you bang on the desk and you my way or the highway at all costs I must win that's just old-fashioned techniques so it, you know there's a whole science behind it now uh, being you know honest and open and re reasonable and you know different techniques you can use so uh, I would definitely get some negotiation skills if you're going to negotiate now, who's going to negotiate the senior representatives that's the primary thing yeah. now the question also is about the project manager now I do think you are negotiating on behalf of the client to, to a degree, to a degree. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the word why is very important in negotiation. So so, so why why does it say that? Or why do you want that amount? Or mm -hmm. why do you want that thing that you're asking for? You know, there's a classic one about, I love spoil it, but an orange. You know, you know, that one of them, you know, yeah. negotiate over an orange. But, and the pills. Yeah, and we're looking at it differently. And if we, if we just split it 50-50, we both die. That's what I'm doing negotiation. You need this, if you don't get it, you'll both die. So it's really hard to how do you conclude that? And then you realise it's a technique to look at a different way of solving the problem itself. So uh, I mean, it doesn't matter the, the names of the roles. If you find yourself in a negotiation position, then I think you should get some training because that area has emerged greatly. And I can't remember until fairly recently ever having any negotiation skills in, in my life. Um, do they need to be mediators? Well, I, I would say to people, you might, this might be like, not quite a career change, but two, two things really, to go bit, do some CBD, learn something new, learn a technique that you should be able to apply at your workplace. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Why, why yeah. not? So, uh, Stanley, perhaps this is something that you need to look at and promote uh, yeah. mediation skills with the uh, project managers and senior representatives. 
So this must be something that the uh, HKMC Hong Kong Yeezy Council can do to help. Absolutely. As I suggested, I, I, I would say a 20 hours of mediation training workshop to provide a basic mediation skill training and if uh, parties are or participants are interested to become uh, a mediator themselves, then they can go through another 20 hours of practical training. Yeah, yeah. That's right. My accreditation course is 40 hours. Yeah, normally 40 you hours. Know, it's quite, they're, they're really good, they're eye openers. You know, yeah. really, really good. Yeah. Uh, the most difficult part of mediation I've found is actually getting some observations in of uh, actual mediation. So, not too much once you, once you get those three observations in to become a mediator, mm. but finding, you know, there's lots of students who are looking for lots of opportunities to observe a mediator in practice. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, let me look at another question. Do you think a mediation course should be part of the procedures in the dispute resolution options under the NDC? Uh, I have to admit for NEC4, I argued this and I said it should be a part and parcel of the dispute escalation process. Yeah. In fact, I think I ended up drafting the B1, 2, and 3 according to a brief. And the nearest we got to that was senior representatives. Okay. So, uh, and, and I think on balance, I think it's right because I think if you force people into, into mediation, it won't work. So That's if you right. voluntarily go with, with a, a real desire to achieve Settlement will work, but if you kick and scream somebody into a room, then it probably won't work. So, I, I, I think it's implied you have a right to mediate. No, no one actually is going to take their, that right away from you. And I think a, a judge would look upon you favourably if you attempted to mediate. You know, it's okay, mandatory here, but in any other country in the world, if you attempt to mediate, I think they would look upon yeah. that favourably. But yeah. forcing people into it, I'm not sure that. I'm sure that works. Well, I wonder if I stand in your poll a different view. Oh, I'm just uh, about to ask uh, Robert to put it uh, as a suggestion in NEC5. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> can't use that sort of thing because people say, when's that <laughs> out there? <laughs> but we did, well, I definitely put it forward as a, I, yeah. I said, let's have a discrete escalation process. In fact, yeah. it was more advanced than that. It was, let's have five, six, seven, eight, let's have MEDA, let's have them all in there. And, and the parties, when they complete the contract data, can tick the ones they want. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll have this one and this yeah, one. The contract data. Yeah. They, they can choose. Yeah. But yeah. they have to not I, to do that. Yeah, so. I, I get your point. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, uh, it's no, probably no good to have this as a mandatory, mandatory course and force people to meet it because it's That's a voluntary right. process. But yeah. maybe there can be a, an option, like second job. An option, just an option. Yeah. Uh, so it was, my idea was. I thought ten different things, yeah. and you choose no more than three. So yeah, we don't, yeah. can't choose ten because we can't yeah. <laughs> for our orange dispute. We can't go to ten different yeah. processes yeah. for that. Just so maybe, along the process. maybe choose more, no more than three of all of yeah. these things. So put all the options yeah. in the contract yeah. data for yeah. parties to choose. Yeah. You, yeah. Anyway, yeah. I should say pain leg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, next one is. Uh, it's regarding the civil resolution board. Uh, what skill sets or expertise should the role of the members of the civil resolution board have? Well, first thing to note is it's not a DRB, it's not a resolution yeah. board, it's a DAB. 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 Avoidance. Avoidance. So be careful with DAB because I've heard recently of a dispute adjudication board. So <laughs> acronyms, we love acronyms, don't we? But what we do in NEC, in only ECC, I think. Yeah. yeah, in W3 is a dispute avoidance board. And yeah. Sandy says they don't, and they help you avoid disputes, they don't decide disputes for you. But what was the question? What well, skill sets, expertise? Uh, so this is going to sound a bit ages, but I do think you need the experience of an industry. You know, Absolutely. I would practically put a school lever as my yeah. DAB person who has no idea about the construction industry or disputes or anything like that. So, I think you have to have cut your teeth in the industry and got some experience to, to, to detect pattern, you know, patterns emerging, trends, have that good nose, good eyes and good ears, yeah. and you can sense problems emerging. It, it, you know, it's, like a, it's like a tsunami early warning system thing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but sometimes you cannot stop it. 
the, 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 the best you can do is to forewarn, uh, and you cannot stop it. Do you think, do you think the D, uh, DAB need to attend your 40 hours or four days uh, PMA training? A PMA training? Yeah, to get understand of the uh, mechanics of the NEC and the wow. skills. Can you imagine, so, the skills. Skills. so imagine their skill sets. They're accredited project manager, they're a mediator, they're an yeah. adjudicator. You, if you've got all the balance of those three, I know the contracts, I know about non-adversarial, I know about adversarial ways. So you're pretty blessed with that knowledge. So you're talking about me? I'm talking about you, <laughs> Ivan. Go speak to Ivan. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, oh, you just advertised it. I, fell, you, I fell into that hook line in a second. <laughs> Buy Ivan, four Ivan, two Ivan. We'll, okay. we'll leave that. Thank you, Ivan. Right. <laughs> well, here's another question. Uh, maybe both of you can uh, can answer, but I like Stanley to answer okay. first because you have for the contractor before. You yes. You work for a contractor, so you can avoid uh, the. Uh, the role of uh, DAB. Okay. So if there's an arbitrator, experienced arbitrator, uh -huh. a very experienced adjudicator, experienced mediator like you and me, and a dispute resolution advisor. So uh, oh, at the council, hang on. And the council as well. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. So different, different expertise. It's like a sweet different shop, levels. isn't it? All yeah. those sweets you can pick. They're all very competent. They're all well known in the yeah. industry. Uh, so who would you choose to undertake? Hang on, is that DRB or DAB? DAB. Yeah, yeah. Both of them. Avoid do both of them? Maybe. Yes. Mm. I would say the DAB board members needs to be equipped with the mediation skills and. Um, under that scenario, I would choose mediator. Yeah. And my second choice would be a dispute resolution advisor. Uh, that's yeah, a DAB. Yeah, what about DAB? What if it was a DRB? And that's not an EC, but yeah. a board that But DRB is, is a board in our contract, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But we can, we can venture. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can straight up. <laughs> what do you reckon for a DRB? Well, it's a DRB for. Right? Resolving a dispute, I mean, so it's a little bit more towards the adversarial, towards the adversarial, and yeah. also the evaluative kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So in that situation, perhaps an adjudicator may, may, may do the job, or the evaluative mediator, or the evaluative yeah. mediator. I think it's Ivan. The answer to this. <laughs> oh, again, <laughs> no, not again. <laughs> I, I I agree with what you say. So. Yeah, yeah. It's just the focus, isn't it? The focus of the board, yeah. are they there to avoid or to, or to resolve, to decide? So you think they have the right, they have to have the right skill set to match the expectations of them. Um, I, I, I am the biggest fan of mediator there is, I think. So mm. I, I, I always believe that that, I haven't yet run into a situation where it doesn't work. Mm. You know? yeah. but, uh, people have explained to that, but you shouldn't use it for this, whatever this is, but haven't yet run into it. And I would just say, not quite give it a go, but you know, <laughs> believing believing your own ability to negotiate and arrive at something you can live with, stay in control of your own disputes, your dispute. Why would you want to hand it over to somebody else? Having said that, there are, there are different natures of dispute arising during the course of work. Some may be uh, regarding liability legal yeah. principle. Yeah. Some may be regarding uh, uh, delay. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding uh, programming matters, yeah. and some may be uh, regarding uh, course matters, so, so quantum matters. Proper, proper, yeah, technical sort of disputes if you like, that just need an adjudicator. I mean, that, that to me is what adjudication was really primarily geared up to do. That at any point in time, yeah. somebody would come in at a moment's notice, ask questions, be inquisitorial, and say, you know, I find this, I decide this. That, that to me was the beauty of adjudication. It's just that adjudication seems to have taken up where arbitration left off. And it's a monster. Yeah. I just I just don't see a lot of difference between adjudication and arbitration these days, which is sad. I mean, in my little head, you get that, let's say, a geotechnical expert who will come in and say, actually, that rock, rock is more dense than that which an experienced contractor could have foreseen. Not that I could do that, but you know. 
but you could get yourself an adjudicator who's well versed in in geotechnical matters to be able to decide such a thing. Yeah, that's why if you choose a, a, yeah. a, the appropriate adjudicator, uh, he'll yeah. be able to give you the yeah. for that specific so, yeah. yeah, yeah. So the an argument, so the difference I've had with other people in the past is that um, uh, pick one adjudicator and they will stick with you for the whole contract. Well, personally, I'd rather pick an adjudicator to match the dispute in front of me. Yeah. So, so I don't want to want a QS necessarily deciding a legal dispute or vice versa. Yeah. Otherwise, they, they will bring their friend and their friend will, will cost twice as much. Yeah. What was the question? Uh, okay, maybe this one. Will Hong Kong follow the footsteps of the UK? Oh. oh. There you go. Yeah, this bottom one. Yeah. Will Hong Kong follow the footsteps of the UK adopting statutory intervention, is it adjudication or whatever? So, is the idea of <coughs> statutory mediation feasible? So, it's about mediation, not adjudication. Uh, well, at the moment, uh, in Hong Kong, uh, in the litigation system in Hong Kong, mediation is mandatory process that. Uh, the disputed party must go through before they embark upon themselves on the litigation process. So uh, whether it's going to work or not, yes, uh, it, it's going to work. But um, my experience on, on a number of cases is that people may not be interested in mediation because they may think the, the differences may not be able to be mediated by any third party. Yeah. Yeah, it's, Sometimes it's a matter of principle right? yeah. or, or, or interpretation of, of the specification, say, for example. People may think, I, this, this sort of things cannot be mediated. But the, the good thing about having the uh, mandatory uh, uh, mediation is that parties are actually being forced to go through the process to examine themselves as to whether they, they are able to close down the differences. And the parties who are not, uh, if you like, uh, proactive or in the mediation process and perhaps could have accepted a, a payment into court um, or, or, or sanctioned payment uh, in the mediation process, then if, it, if the party rejected this offer, then uh, the court will award adverse course orders against them. So this is very important. So answering your question, yes, it may help having a statutory intervention by way of mediation. But then you have to really look into the matters being mediated. I mean, U UK hasn't got such a intervention for mediation. Mm. I'll say that, but actually now the small claims court will ask you to mediate or will ask you to explain why you haven't mediated. I believe um, it's, it's, things have changed. In the UK, the statutory uh, thing process is adjudication. So you're forced to go to adjudication if one yeah. party wants to go to, if your particular contract meets the definition of what is a construction contract. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not that will repeat in Hong Kong, well, let's see, it take me 10 years to negotiate a similar oh, force. I don't know, in itself, that's about the state of the industry, isn't it? I can remember. So I think that was 1995 or so, the UK legislation around then was just chaos, utter adversarialism, a backlog of course. I think it took three three years I thought we'll start once to get your day in court, you had to queue up and wait three years, which is disgraceful to be moral. Just mm -hmm. wrong, isn't it? If, if you need justice, to have to wait three years is just wrong. Yeah. Um, what, but is that here? Do, you know, do, what, well, about three years, yes, for litigation, three yes, but, so now. but wow. if we have the SNPL uh, legislate, uh, then the, uh, the adjudicator under the SOPL will be given only 55 days to adjudicate. Yeah, I think that's too many, way too many. UK's, <laughs> UK's, UK what, come on, 28? 38 or something. No, 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 it's, a, it's less than a month. Yeah. That's enough time, but, that, but that's, that's the problem is, in its one month, it was aimed at, at you know uh, disputes that could be decided on their own, not 
like big final account disputes, yeah. multi-million or billion dollars. It's not aimed at that, it's not aimed at that process. Yeah. A little bit of rough judgment, uh, what do you think of rough justice, I think. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's about getting the right money in the right pocket sooner rather than later. Yeah. And if you feel that it's a little bit too rough, you can go again at some point in the future. But let's get the money into the right pocket. So you, you, the accolades, I think, of adjudication are right and proper. Whereas mediation, we're not trying to do that. It's not like shifting money to a subcontractor. Mm -hmm. it's just, it might be going the other way around. You might start off. In fact, I, I, that's exactly one of the mediation I did a while ago. You owe me 17,000 UK pounds turned into actually you owe me half a million. <laughs> so somebody come like that and, and ended up they actually we sorted the problem out, but it turned into actually you owe me half a million. Um, imagine that one emerging in court. Next question. All right, so maybe we have uh, one last question. I think this question is uh, quite good, which is a research type question. <laughs> uh, university students like to do such uh, research. So the question is why Hong Kong still keep on promoting arbitration? mediation as such, and still heard nothing about education in Hong Kong. But the first time you come to Hong Kong to promote uh, ADC, we had a education course, isn't it? Yeah. Which is the first one. Yeah, it was the first, that was 18 years Which ago. I attended. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right, uh, <laughs> you have been uh, practice education in the UK since uh, 1990s, and still having heard nothing at all in Hong Kong? Is it because it is not useful at all? Well, you may wish to share your UK experience yeah. on that. Or is it the Hong Kong government reluctant to introduce the same legislation like the housing grant and, and regeneration act? I can't tell on behalf of the government, but I see if I stand you heard of anything about it. Okay, that. let me go. Now, <coughs> the there are consultation documents issued by the government in mid-2015. Um, it's a consultation document uh, by which uh, uh, professional institutions and, and trade unions have been asked to give their, their opinions and comments on, on, the, uh, on the consultation document. Now, uh, in April 2016, a report was published on the consultation process. <clears throat> and since then, there are a lot of discussions on whether adjudication is, is uh, appropriate in Hong Kong or not, because there has been discussions whether uh, extension of time should be included within the jurisdiction of the adjudicator. Mm. Long discussion, long discussion, until very recently, sometime in mid-March actually, the government has decided to uh, ask uh, uh, stakeholders in, in the construction industry in Hong Kong for opinion uh, and comments on, on a further uh, uh, draft technical circular. And that, that, that there is a, a webinar hosted by the Hong Kong Institution of uh, Surveyors uh, talking about this uh, further consultation. And uh, it's look, it looks like the, the Hong Kong government is determined to push through this um, adjudication thing in the construction industry, uh, which is a good move actually. For the first step, the, the government is proposing implementing the adjudication provisions on the uh, subcontracts issued under the, uh, the government form of contract. Well, yeah, I, 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 I'm really hoping that this, this will go ahead, but I, at the same time, I, I, I would uh, foresee that there may be a lot of changes in the construction industry if the uh, the uh, proposed legislation is only applicable to the subcontractors at the moment. I think it should be applied across the board. Okay, maybe what I think about the UK? <clears throat> uh, I'm not a fan of how adjudication has turned out in the UK, so um, it, it just it's, it's a bit of a monster in my opinion lots of hijacking lots of immoral practice lots yeah. of christmas eve you know late notification it's just, it's just wrong and improper i just have a problem with things like that where mm -hmm. one party is trying to see maximum advantage by 
various tactics. It just it just bothers me. The time frame problem. is challenging. Yeah, it's, it's challenging, but it's 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 not challenging if you break down bite size. You know, the, the the disputes one at a time in bite size. Then I don't think it is challenging. It's when we lump 10, 15, 20 things in together at the same time that's that's it's incredibly challenging. Um, so, so I think it has its place. So I've no idea how to draft this, but to me, adjudication is perfect where mediation uh, isn't appropriate. How about that? And sometimes you do need to know what is this quotation for a conversation going worth? What is the additional time? What is the additional money? I don't think you should mediate that. I think you should adjudicate it. But ideally, get the parties negotiate, you know, learn the negotiating skills, learn about NEC, get accredited and sort the problem out yourself. I don't want problems to be emerged. I want them to sort their problems out in, in the first place. However, if they violently disagree, then I think adjudication is probably a better place than mediation. But when you have six, eight, ten different things, then mediation is probably better. How would you draft legislation to meet those Different requirements is difficult, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, well, thank you very much. I think uh, uh, we are almost there. And uh, well, just like to we uh, remind uh, all attendees: if you haven't put your name and email address yet, and you like to have the CPD certificate, please do it now. This is the last second you can do so. But if you dispute that with Ivan, then <laughs> we will mediate it for yeah. you and we'll solve the show. No adjudicators. No, no adjudicators. No, no. Well, try to find okay. yourself an evaluator or facilitator from <laughs> the mediator. <laughs> yeah, and please do the online evaluation survey by uh, using this, uh, what's it, barcode or whatever code? QR code. QR code, exactly. <laughs> Right. Don't use Ivan for technical things. That's what we. Um, that's cool. only good for the first two years ago. Years. <laughs> okay. Our next event we will all co-join, uh, co-organize with uh, the HKIS. Uh, it will be held on 13th of April, 2021, and it will be open for registration soon. Outstanding questions. If there are any, which I'm sure there are, but we haven't already answered. Oh, oh exactly. Uh, there may be a, um, a lot of questions that we are not able to address due to the time limit. So we will address the questions in writing and publish on the website. And there will be links sent to you. Oh, Thank you. Video and the questions. Yeah, if you like this video, please smash the like button. Remember to subscribe, like and share. Sounds very familiar to me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank you all.